Warning, this content may be upsetting or disturbing to some audiences. Jeffrey Dahmer gave the people in his apartment building sandwiches that have been made from his victim's flesh. What are the most disturbing serial killer facts? Pee Wee Gaskins, most prolific serial killer in South Carolina drove around in a hearse with a bumper sticker that read I haul dead people. He told people that he needed it to take the bodies of people he killed to his private cemetery. He claimed to have killed between 100 and 110 people. In the John Wayne G case, there were so many bodies crammed underneath the house that the bodies melted together and the bones had to be sorted for more than two years to put together the full skeletons. Apparently one of the ways he would escalate a police search for his victims was by calling into the police station anonymously and reporting a fake sighting of the victim. This led the police to believe that the victims had not in fact been missing, but instead had run away, thus deprioritizing their search. The Hillside Stranglers picked up a young woman to murder. Then they discovered that her father was Peter Lorre, a legendary Hollywood character actor. They let her go because they feared that killing a celebrity's daughter would bring too much attention down. Strangely enough, in 1931 Lorre starred in Fritz Lang's M, one of the first serial killer films, as a Berlin child murderer. The movie prominently features the Berlin criminal underworld trying to catch the killer on their own because his murders are drawing too much attention from the police, hampering their own illegal activities. Jeffrey Dahmer gave the people in his apartment building sandwiches that could have possibly been made from his victim's flesh. I went to Marquette University in Milwaukee, not far from Dahmer's apartment building. When the news broke, my boyfriend at the time was riding the bus and a lady was freaking out and crying uncontrollably. She lived in the building and he apparently hosted cookouts regularly. I always think about the PTSD the first cop to open the refrigerator must have. Towards the end right before he got caught, he had so many bodies in his apartment that he ran out of room and stored one victim in his bathtub. He proceeded to shower over him every day for a month. Think about that. Straddling over a rotten corpse to get fresh and clean for the day. Unreal. He also tried to make sex zombies out of some of his victims by drilling holes in their heads while they were alive and pouring acid into the holes. The twistedness and desperation of such an act is fascinating and truly goes to show how disturbed he was. Makes you wonder to what would have happened if he was successful, like would he stop killing or would he just amass a growing harem of sex slaves? Pedro Alonso Lopez pleaded guilty to the murders of over 100 girls and only received a maximum sentence of 16 years as that was the maximum possible sentence in Ecuador. He was released despite promising to continue killing but disappeared shortly after. He was released from a psychiatric ward in Bogota, after Colombia brought charges against him as soon as he got out of prison, not directly from prison. Colombian authorities, on some small level, may have kept tabs on him and slipped his location to a few interested families. There are a number of unconfirmed reports that he was tortured and killed by bereaved family members after he was released from prison. Some of the stories even mention assistance and participation from local authorities. He's very likely dead and buried, what was left of him, in the hills somewhere. The foothills where they probably took him would be in the Andes, which served as his killing grounds. He disappeared in 1998, or 2001, or 2009. A lot of solid sources conflict on this after being declared sane and posting a $50 bail. Dennis Rader, aka BTK, by and torture kill, started communicating with police after years of silence in like 2004-ish. He had gone decades without being caught and once again started sending taunting letters and items to them. He asked them if he could be traced if he sent them his writings on a floppy disk and they assured him through a communication in a newspaper that no, they couldn't trace him. He sent them a floppy disk and they found metadata linking to his church. He was arrested shortly thereafter. He was hurt that they would lie to him because he thought they had developed a rapport. The serial killer Balakis liked to pickle people in barrels stored in his basement. Someone figured it out but they couldn't get him because he was fighting in World War I. By the time they tracked him down he had disappeared and left a dead guy in his hospital bed. He supposedly joined the French Foreign Legion and deserted the two, and I think history loses track of him after that, with the exception of one possible sighting as a janitor in New York. The janitor disappeared before anyone could confirm it. The Golden State Killer, would often break into the homes of couples, making the woman tie up the man. He would stack dishes on the back of the man and threaten that if he heard the dishes fall, he would kill everyone in the house, then he would assault the woman repeatedly and ransack the house for hours. At a community meeting about the molester, a macho man stood up and went on a rant about how a real man would never let such a thing happen to him or his wife. 
The killer proceeded to attack that man and his wife soon after, meaning he was attending the community meeting about himself. Dorangel Vargas killed and ate at least 10 people. He only ate men because he said their meat tasted better than women's. He also wouldn't eat fat people because he thought they contained too much cholesterol. Journalist Vlado Teneski was caught when he reported on his own crimes and included information that hadn't been released to the public and only the killer could know. Of the four women who disappeared, three were found displayed signs of being viciously assaulted, molested and tortured before being strangled to death with a phone cord. Though the police had initially revealed that the women had been strangled, they had not said with what. Noticing that Taniski had correctly named the specific type of phone cord used, they arrested him on suspicion of murder. After questioning him, they obtained a search warrant for his home. His house was filled with pornography, and notes about the crimes. He had been carrying out the murders, then writing about them in great detail for the paper, as if taunting the police. I am surprised we don't hear more about Robert Hansen in popular culture. He would kidnap women and turn them loose in the Alaskan wilderness, where he would then hunt them down like animals and kill them. He didn't have the highest number of victims, but his method of hunting them for sport is absolutely insane. He's not the only one to have done it. I forgot his name but apparently a wealthy Mexican politician had the same approach. He once spared a girl and returned her to the street because she refused to run. Sadly, she was not believed and he killed several more before being arrested. When police eventually came to the house of Ed Gein, they found an absolute pigsty. Gein had been living alone since the death of his brother in a barn fire, it's speculated that Gein may have killed him, and had let much of the house go into disrepair. They found countless body parts from his various grave digging excursions, including a bag of wilted female genitals and, of course, the infamous skin lampshade and half-finished woman suit made of human skin. There were maggots living in old dishes in the kitchen. It was the type of disorganized mess that you would expect from a man who spent his nights completely disconnected from reality. All except one room. His mother's room upstairs remained pristine, except for dust that had collected, and seemingly untouched from the time of her death years earlier. He had such a fear or respect for his mother that he was afraid to set foot in her room long after she had died. He claimed to hear her voice criticizing him from time to time. This was the central experience that inspired Norman Bates' character to maintain his mother's home and image in Psycho. Also a fun fact about Gein, in Taxi Driver, Travis Bickle makes an offhand comment when leaving a diner that he had a cup of coffee and a slice of apple pie with cheese on top. In exchange for details to investigators after his capture, Gein requested the same meal. Albert Fish would stick needles into his pelvis when he was masturbating. Stick them so deep sometimes they would get stuck. He told this to police, they didn't believe him until they saw the x-ray. He had so many, and had been doing it for so long, that there were needles decomposing inside him. He knew he was messed up, knew what he was doing was wrong. His kids caught him doing some crazy things, too, on several occasions. He loved to get spanked and eat feces and drink urine. He called them peanut butter and cider respectively. He once spent a few months trying to convince a single mother to watch his handicapped son. He told her to punish him when he acted up and, over the course of their correspondence, told her to do nastier and nastier things until he dropped the act altogether. He was asking her to poop on him and for him. His letters to her are what got him arrested, as she was unnerved by what he was saying and took the letters to the police for indecency laws violations. In the 70s there was a serial killer who was known for raping and killing women. He went on a dating show and the woman ended up choosing him but luckily she cancelled the date just before. He also defended himself in court using different voices. It's hilarious, creepy and sad all at the same time. His name is Rodney Alcala. You can find a video on YouTube. It's really creepy. Dennis Rader, aka BTK, by and torture kill, started communicating with police after years of silence in like 2004-ish. He had gone decades without being caught and once again started sending taunting letters and items to them. He asked them if he could be traced if he sent them his writings on a floppy disk and they assured him through a communication in a newspaper that no, they couldn't trace him. He sent them a floppy disk and they found metadata linking to his church. He was arrested shortly thereafter. He was hurt that they would lie to him because he thought they had developed a rapport. John Norman Collins used to pick up women on his motorcycle, the bodies of his victims, women, used to be dumped here and there but they were always washed. Turns out he only killed women who were on their period. Also, he was referred to as John Norman Collins during his trial, 
He later changed his last name to Chapman, because there was a lawyer in town whose name was John Collins and this was a way to distinguish between them. Brazilian serial killer Little Petey murdered over 40 people in prison. He began by murdering the gang that killed his girlfriend and then stabbing his father, who was in prison for killing his mother, during a visit. He was well liked because he was considered a sort of vigilante avenger, despite killing indiscriminately within prison, no difference between drug possession and a murderer. Because of Brazil's odd sentencing laws, he could only serve a maximum of 30 years, and is currently a YouTuber and ranch hand. Many years ago I read the entire police report on the Green River Killer. I was fascinated by his attempts to cover his tracks by buying new car tires and destroying shoes and getting new ones after murders, to avoid leaving traceable tracks behind. Also fascinating that he took the jewelry off his victims and left it in the ladies restroom at his workplace and got off on seeing the found jewelry on various women around the office. Edmund Kemper, also known as the co-ed killer, committed a series of murders in California before finally killing his abusive mother, at which point he drove to Arizona called the police, confessed to everything, and waited for them to pick him up at the payphone. He provided intimate details of the case before he could get representation so there was no way to get out of being found guilty for his crimes. In court, a lawyer asked him what he felt was a just punishment for what he'd done. He thought about it and replied, death by torture. To this day, he declines to attend parole hearings, and has repeatedly asserted that people like him do not belong in society. Ted Bundy worked at a suicide hotline center with author Ann Rule. He actually did a good job as a volunteer according to Rule and successfully talked people out of suicide. He would also walk her to her car at the end of their late night shift to make sure she was safe. She said he was concerned for her safety because they worked a late shift and according to him there are a lot of weirdos out there. She also said that she saw no signs of him being a killer and when he was first arrested she didn't believe he could have done it. Many victims did survive David Parker Ray, the toy box killer, but did not remember it, as he would kidnap victims. He used them as sex slaves for a few months, drugged them, and cleaned them thoroughly before dropping them off unconscious at the side of the road hundreds of miles away. Only some women picked up by him were killed, still more than enough to be classified as a serial killer. Issei Sagawa, a cannibal who was caught in France and pronounced insane, However after going to a mental asylum in Japan they declared him as being sane, he checked out straight after. He's still free to this day if I remember correctly, and in interviews has stated that he may kill and eat human flesh again. While I was watching the interviews I felt beyond unsettled, really doesn't make me feel better that he is still out there. Gary Ridgway. The guy got away with life in prison by giving away the spots where his victims were buried and made the police take him back to the sites to relive the crimes over again. In court videos he just sits like a deer in the headlights as families of his victims tell him he'll burn in hell and other very nasty things understandably. But the father of one of his victims was hardcore Christian and he got up to the stand and said, despite everything you've heard today I believe in Jesus Christ's teachings and he believes in forgiveness and sir, I forgive you. And it brought the serial killer to tears to which the judge told him he didn't have a right to fake any form of guilt which he clearly didn't have. Richard Kuklinski killed a man and left his body in an oil drum outside of a diner just to see how long it would take for someone to investigate. He would order sandwiches from the place and sit on the drum while he ate. He also made a clicking noise with his mouth when he was angry. If you heard that, you were as good as dead.